growing up in a house without faith, you know, I didn't much think about God or think about death. You know, heaven or hell, I thought death, that was it. It's over, just like whatever it was before we were born. And that's just how I viewed life, and I thought that's how it was. And I started uh, getting involved with the wrong crowds, a little drinking, doing drugs, and stuff like that. And I decided, good way to make money. I already do them. I already have enough of them. Why not start selling them, right? And so uh, my junior year, I had a teacher, and uh, he invited me to church, which was shocking because that was very frowned upon. The card he gave me was just an invitation to church. But I'm not going to go to church, you know, that's not where I go at this time, you know, I don't know anything about that. And my friend and I went to go sell some drugs and, uh, and we're getting ready and stuff like that and I find that card. Just conveniently enough, I see it and I'm thinking to myself like, man, I told that teacher I would go, you know, I really liked him. So I said, hey man, you got this one on your own, right? He's like, don't worry about it. I'm like, okay, cool. So I go to the church building. And uh, the, the preacher preaches a sermon, and I got up and went to the back, and it's just funny how God works. Even my teacher, I went to pray with him, and even he was like, all right, man, I'll see you later. He thought I was leaving. He, there's no way he's accepting Jesus, you know? And I was like, no, I was hoping you'd pray for me. And he straightens up real quick. He's like, yeah, yeah, you know? And he brings it in, and I just accepted God right there. And I get a text message. It says my friend who went on that drug deal got shot. And I'm thinking I used to get this message. You know, that could have been me. I could have been sent to hell. I wasn't going to heaven at the time, obviously. I didn't know Jesus until this church service. And then when I think I got saved, it really made me realize, like, you can gather everything up here on earth, but what's it worth if you lose your soul? Always good to know that the Lord gave me that eternal perspective now, and then I can really share that and make people realize, like, stuff here doesn't matter. Some people I used to run with, I just didn't associate with anymore because it was just too much bad influence on me. And, uh, Unfortunately, one of those people was an old buddy of mine I used to run with named Preston. I found out he was real sad and depressed, really didn't have anything to live for, and uh, ultimately ended up taking his own life. And uh, after I heard that happen, it broke me down, broke my heart, because I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's over for him, and he's unfortunately in hell, and it's real hard to live with, real hard to have that regret, knowing that something I could have said could have affected his eternity. I learned from that that I never know when someone's going to go. I never know what's going on in someone's head. I never know when they might take their own life or could just die from, for whatever reason. So I try to be more bold and really share my faith. And it's just crazy. A lot of my friends in the past, uh, just how it was, just out of nowhere seeing this crazy 180, you know, they're just, what? what is, that's not you. That's you doing this, this. Who are we supposed to get our stuff from now? Stuff like that. Man, that's not my problem. But it's great because, you know, some people, who actually have been like, hey, what happened? I told them, and they've seen such a dramatic life change that they've come to church, and now they're getting saved. It's, they, they come here with me now sometimes, and it's just real cool to see how some people are just like, man, if it can happen for him, it must be something real there, and they just go pursue it themselves. All right, good morning, Hollywood Christian School. Good to be back with you all again another week. I feel like it's been a long time since I've been able to connect with you all. But nevertheless, we will pick up where we left off at on our series on understanding the kingdom. Uh, the video you just watched was, was, is kind of related to where we're going today uh, as we study this parable of the net, uh, which is found in Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 47. It's a small and simple parable, uh, but it's very profound. Because remember uh, several weeks ago, we studied a parable on the wheat and the tares and how we recognize that there would be a point where God would separate the wheat from the tares. There would be a definite point of separation. And we see a similar theme repeated here in this parable of the net. And whenever the Bible repeats a theme or whenever Jesus repeats something that he's teach teaching, he's trying to make sure that we definitely get this and you only live once so make sure that you make it count you want your life to be right you want to make sure that you get it right you want to make sure that you're serving God and he's the center of your life of your life uh, while you have it life is too too important and too valuable for us to waste and part of what we want to point out in this parable is how the life that we live now can impact us for all eternity the Bible says that our lives are but a vapor which means that compared to all of eternity the time we spend alive here on earth is a very short amount of time, very extremely short amount of time. But that extremely short amount of time impacts you for all eternity. And so we want to make sure we not only understand life, but we want to make sure that we live it well. So in our series in, in Understanding the Kingdom, we're picking up in the, the Gospel of Matthew and the parable of the net. And beginning in chapter 13, verse 47, the Bible says this, 
And the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. And then verse 49 says, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So short, simple parable, but some extremely profound points. Here, here are three main things that we want to make sure that we get from this parable as we talk about it today. Three main things we want to make sure you get is, is understanding the, the point of the net, the fishermen, and the furnace. We got to get those three things down packed. The net, the fishermen, and the furnace. Now this is a parable, and you, in, you interpret parables uh, kind of like you do with dreams. You, you can't look at every single little detail of it. You have to get the main point. What is the main thing that Jesus is trying to show us in this parable? And so the three main things that we have to look at is, are the net, the fishermen, and the furnace. So let's take a look at it. One thing about uh, this parable is, is the term that Jesus used to describe a fishing net. Because there are all types of nets. There are those little nets you use, you just scoop it down into the water and, and, and pick something up. Um, but Jesus wasn't referring to that type of net. The type of net that Jesus was actually referring to can be commonly uh, known as a drag net. It was a huge net. And these nets were so big that sometimes they could stretch a half a mile wide. And you would either tie them to the shore and drag it back in, or you would tie it to the boat and drag it along with the boat. But they were huge, huge nets, gigantic nets. And everything that those nets swept through, it would pick up everything in its path and carry it along to the shore or whatever, wherever the boat was going. So these were gigantic nets that Jesus was describing. That was an important point. So fishermen would use these huge nets to gather up all these fish. And, and the thing about it is sometimes those nets were so huge, they would even scrub the bottom of the lake. And when they scrubbed the bottom of the lake, they would pick up everything that was along the bottom of that lake as well. And so when you finally got back to the shore, you would have not only the fish in there, but all kind of stuff caught up in this net as well. But the fish in there was so valuable to the fishermen because it was their livelihood, it was how they stayed alive, that they would painstakingly sit down and they would just sit among all these fish in this huge, gigantic net, and they would separate the trash from the fish, and then among the fish, they would separate the good fish from the bad fish. They would take the good fish and they would put them into containers to take them to the market, and they would take the bad fish and throw them away. Not back into the water, but throw them away. So that was this point that the fishermen would use to separate what was valuable to them, what would extend their livelihood, and what was not. And the whole point of this parable is that there is a point in life where God will make a decision about whether we currently hold value in his kingdom. Just like those fish would capture everything around it and it would impact everything, the kingdom of God is just like that as well. The kingdom of God, as we learned in the parable of the wheat and the tares, they're both good and bad in the kingdom of God on earth right now. There are good things and there are bad things in the kingdom. That's, that's the way the kingdom exists right now. Sometimes we get this image of the kingdom where everything is, is so perfect and right. That's heaven. Our goal is to get earth to look like heaven. Heaven is already perfect. Heaven is already in order. Remember when Jesus prayed what we call the Lord Prayer? He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. So Jesus recognized that, that heaven is the standard, and we're trying to get earth to look like heaven. But we're not there yet. Right now, there's some messed up stuff that's mixed in with God's kingdom. And that's fine, because remember, that's not a threat for God. It's okay. God does not need a perfect beginning to reach a perfect end. And so in the kingdom, just like that net would drag up all of this extra stuff, there's all this other stuff mixed in the kingdom right now. So this is why you can be in the world right now, recognizing that God is sovereign, he sits on his throne, and yet you can see so much wrong in the world. This is why you can come to Hollywood Christian school and still have classmates that ain't quite figured out life yet. 
You still have goofballs around. You still have people that, that ain't really true living for God, even though they call themselves a Christian. That's allowed right now. But there is a definite point where God will draw a line and say, you are in my kingdom and you are not. And we have to understand the urgency and the reality of it. So the size of the net then references the pervasive and inescapable impact of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God impacts everything, whether we accept it or not, whether we believe it or not, whether we see it or not, whether we experience it or not, the kingdom of God impacts everything you see. It impacts everything. That's how big the kingdom of God is. Just like that huge, gigantic net is so pervasive in, in a lake that nothing can escape it. The kingdom of God is the same way. Its impact is over the whole entire earth. And you don't see that because you can't measure it right now but it's impacting everything. You cannot escape the impact of the kingdom of God. So in the current condition of the kingdom, there exists good and bad, right and wrong. That's the current condition of it. And again, just like with the weeding and the tares, that's allowed for right now because it's okay. God is a merciful God, and he understands that mankind is not perfected. And God offers us this thing called grace. And grace is the opportunity and the time to get it right. Sometimes we use grace as an excuse for sin. Grace is not an excuse for sin. Grace is time that is given to you to correct the sin. So grace gives us an opportunity to get it right. So that's the importance of the net in it. It speaks to the pervasiveness and the inescapable impact of the kingdom of God. But the next thing that comes out of it is the importance of the fishermen. See, the action of the fishermen is the key point in the parable. And this is how I know this. I know this because when you look at that parable, Jesus didn't really expound on the net. Jesus didn't really expound on the fish. He didn't talk about how many fish there were. He didn't talk about what type of fish there were. He, he didn't say what size the fish were. He didn't expound on any of it. The, the only thing Jesus expounded on was what the fishermen did. And so since Jesus expounded on that point, that makes it even more important. So we have to recognize and take another look at what the fishermen did. The fishermen went and he separated, they separated the good from the bad. And then Jesus made a point in that parable. He said that there will be a time when you will separate the righteous from the unrighteous, the good from the bad. That, that word good is important because for something to be good it really means that it fulfills its purpose. For something to be good means it fulfills its purpose. Think back to the beginning of time in the book of Genesis when God had created the earth. And the Bible says that when God had created everything, he said it was good and it was what? Very good. Thank you, one person. He said it was good and very good. That word good indicated that what God had created was fulfilling his purpose. It was completely fulfilling his purpose. So when we say something is good, that means it fulfills purpose. So what makes you good is not really your name. What makes you good is not really your social standing. What makes you good is whether or not you are fulfilling purpose. So we have to understand purpose. We have to understand identity. We have to understand all those things. Those are all fundamental to living life in the kingdom of God. But good means to fulfill purpose. That term righteous, though, we hear it all the time in church. But that word righteous is actually a legal term. That means to be in proper alignment, or in other words, in right standing with a governing authority. Remember, a kingdom is not a religion. Some people use righteousness to refer to how well you adhere to a particular religion, how much you pray, how much you go to church, how much you meditate, how much you fast, how enlightened you are. 
Sometimes people use righteousness to refer to religion, but, but righteousness is not a religious term. Righteousness is a legal term that refers to being in proper alignment or in right standing with governing authority. A kingdom is not a religion. A kingdom is a form of government. It's not a religion, it's a government. So when the Bible uses the term righteousness, it refers to whether or not you're in a good standing with that government. You live right now under the authority of a government, United States government. That the United States of America has laws that you have to follow. Now, when you break those laws, you mess up your relationship between yourself and your government. And depending on what laws you break, that government can take your rights as citizens away. We call that going to jail. So there's a, a break in the relationship whenever you are not in a right relationship with a governing authority. To be righteous in the kingdom of God means to be in a right, right relationship with the king. But then there's another part to that parable as well, which is the fiery furnace. The fiery furnace is simple. It represents hell. It simply represents hell. Now, we don't like to talk about this nowadays. We don't like to hear about hell. We want to talk about heaven. We don't want to hear about punishment and wrath. We want to talk about grace and mercy. But just like heaven is a literal place, so is hell. Just like heaven is a literal place, so is hell. They're both real places. Heaven, heaven is not some figurative place. It's not some symbolic place. It's an actual place, a real place. This is how we get the term kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a country. Kingdom of heaven is the governing authority of that country. And the governing authority of that country is influencing earth through the form of colonization. Earth is simply a colony of the kingdom of heaven. But heaven is real, and on the same terms, hell is real. And if we don't grasp that, if we don't get that, then we can get to the end of life and realize we haven't done this thing right. And there are some consequences to pay behind that. I want to figure out life right now. And, and listen, hear my heart. This is why I really don't care about coming in here and entertaining you. I really don't have to stand up here and try to make you just shout and run all over the place and do crazy stuff. That, that, that's fine to, to some people. I want to make sure that you get this message. I want to make sure that you understand this because just like you go before God, I do too. And when I get before God and God asks me, Mike, that you fulfill my purpose, that you carry out my will, that you do my plan the way I gave it to you, how much did you stick to it? I have to give an account for what I say to you. Because God has given me a purpose. He's given me a plan. He's shown me his will. He's told me what I have to do in my life. And if I don't do it, I have to stand before him like you. And I want to make sure that you understand his kingdom and how it functions and how it operates. But hell is a real place. And a lot of people ask the question, how can a loving God send people to hell? It's not that God sends people to hell, it's that they choose it. God doesn't send you to hell, you choose hell. Here's how. You have to go back to the definition of a kingdom. Remember, a kingdom is a king impacting a territory with his will, his purpose, and his intentions through the influence of his citizens. That's the definition of a kingdom. Now, you can't just get in a kingdom. You can't just be in a kingdom. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. All kingdoms are based on citizenships. And in, in a kingdom, you're only a citizen of that kingdom if you were born in it. So citizenship in a kingdom is determined by birth. It's determined by birth. You're not naturalized into a kingdom. You're born into that kingdom. So you're, you're either born into that kingdom or you're not. And that king chooses to grant you citizenship. 
This is why Jesus made that statement to Nicodemus, and you probably have heard it all the time if you've been in church at any point of your life. For John chapter 3, verse 3, it says this, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, say spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. When we talk about this concept of being born again, it means that I'm giving up on my old life. I'm giving up on my old way of thinking. I am allowing God's spirit to work in my heart, to govern me, to guide me, to lead me, to teach me. And I am going to listen to him and his word and his inspiration. And I am going to follow him with my whole heart and my life. And I'm going to give up on my old way of life. At that point, I die to myself, I die to my sin, and I'm now born and birthed in his spirit because his spirit is now abiding in me. His spirit is now ruling in me. His spirit is now living in me. So I am born again. And this is why being born again is so important. This, this is why being saved is so important. This is why accepting Christ is so important. And this is why we make such an emphasis on it when we go to church or when we sit in chapel. Because I've got to go through that. Because if I'm not born again, I cannot be in the kingdom of God. I have to be governed by his Holy Spirit and his love. I'm getting to my point. Since the kingdom of heaven is literally a kingdom, it's a form of government, here's what you have to understand. Every kingdom keeps a registry of its citizens. So when you are born again, into the kingdom of God, your name gets written into what we call the book of life. The book of Revelation talks about this. There's a backside to your paper, by the way. The book of Revelation talks about this. In chapter 20, verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Every kingdom functions that way. The way they know that you are the, just a citizen of their kingdom is by your birth certificate. When you were born into that kingdom, your name was written into a registry. It was written into a book to show that this is a citizen of this kingdom. Why is that important? Because if you are a citizen of that kingdom, then that king is now responsible for you. That king is responsible for your food, your clothing, your shelter. He's responsible for your life. He's responsible for protecting you. He's responsible for providing for your every single need according to his riches, according to his glory. Because in a kingdom, everything belongs to the king. So if your name is in that book, that king is responsible for you. Even if you went to another country to visit somebody, if something happened and you got stuck in that country, that king is now responsible for coming to get you. This is where your faith comes from when we talk about Christianity, when we talk about living as kingdom. So this is where your faith comes from. It's because I know my king's power to provide for me. I understand my king's ability to help me. I understand that my God is so faithful that he would never leave me, nor would he forsake me. Forsake me. My king is a righteous king. My king is a good king, and he will supply all of my needs according to his riches and his glory. This is why I trust him. This is why I do what he says, because he's been faithful to me even when I wasn't faithful. He's always been my guide. He's always been my provider. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not just because you call on my name. Not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he says this, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now go back to the definition of a kingdom. Remember, a kingdom is a king impacting a territory with his will. So if you say that you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, then that means that you honor your king by carrying out his will. If you don't carry out his will, you're dishonoring your king. 
by dishonoring your king, you're in active rebellion against him. And in any kingdom that's punishable by death, say death. In any kingdom that's punishable by death, say death. <laughs> when you reject the will of God for your life, you're in active rebellion against him, which means that you are now punishable according to the laws of his kingdom by death. Here's the thing. Whenever you die in a kingdom, whenever you die anywhere, even if you're not in a kingdom, whenever you die, that's just water filling up the baptistry. Don't worry about it. Whenever you die, you always, your body is always returned to its country of origin. So wherever you are a citizen of and you die, your body just goes there because that's where your body belongs. So if, if you are an American citizen and you die in Afghanistan, your family can now have your body brought back to America because this is the country that you are a citizen of. If you die and you are not a citizen of the kingdom of God, there's only one other kingdom. There is no middle ground. There's only one other kingdom. That's the kingdom of darkness, kingdom of the world. That country is hell. So when you choose to reject the will of the king, when you choose to disregard life as he would have it be, then you're in active rebellion against him, which means that you are not a citizen of his kingdom. So if you die and you're not a citizen of the kingdom of God, then why should the kingdom of God accept you? You're not its citizen. Do y'all follow that? If you are an American citizen, why should the government of Afghanistan come and get your body and bring it to Afghanistan? That makes no sense, does it? So if you're not in the kingdom of God, if you're not a citizen of God's kingdom and you die, why should that country come and get you? Why should you be brought back to that country and you are not a citizen of it? You chose to reject this kingdom. Therefore, you accepted the other one. God does not send you to hell. You choose hell by rejecting him. God is life. God is light. God is love. When you reject him, you reject all of those things. You reject love. You reject light. You reject him. You reject life itself. Your citizenship in the kingdom of God is determined by your relationship with the king. Whether or not you're a citizen of the kingdom of God is determined by whether or not you have a right relationship with him. Your citizenship in the kingdom of God is not determined by your church membership. It's determined by whether or not you have a right relationship with the king. Your relationship with the king is determined by the centrality of his will in your life. If his will is at the center of, and you operate through it, you have a right relationship with him. If you're not even concerned about his will, or you're halfway doing his will, or you do his will when it's convenient for you, or you don't even know what his will is, you got a problem. Because in the kingdom of God, there is no middle ground when right and wrong are concerned. You're either right or you're wrong. There is no middle ground. Now, the world will have you think differently. The world will have you think you can live however you want. You can do whatever you want. But in the kingdom of God, it doesn't work that way. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He said when Satan rebelled, the battle lasted that long. He was out of there. Why? Because there is no right, there is no middle ground when right and wrong is concerned in the kingdom of God. You're either with him or you are against him. So just as God separates the wheat from the tares, he will separate the righteous from the unrighteous. Just as God separates the wheat from the tares, he will separate the righteous from the unrighteous. That's not a religious term. It's a term that determines whether or not you have a proper relationship with him. And your relationship with him is determined by whether or not 
the center, his will is at the center of your life. So the real question that we have to answer today really is, is God the center of my life? Have I really and truly accepted him to a point where I make my decisions based off of him and his word and his will and his plan? Or am I still doing things my own way? Am I still trying to accomplish my goal? Or am I just doing this because mama and daddy did it? Am I just doing this because to, it makes me feel good? Or, or am I really and truly actively intentionally seeking God to understand him and his way and his order? That's the question you've got to answer. Is God really at the center of my life? Because if he's at the center of your life, I can't judge you, but I can judge your fruit. Because Jesus himself said that you will know a tree by its fruit. Are you bearing fruit that's in alignment with God's will? Are you a positive encouragement or your negative discouragement? Which one are you? Do you lift people up or are you tearing them down? Are you being progressive in life or are you giving up on life? Is God at sending your will? Take a look at this video for me real quick and then we'll be done. Going into high school, I didn't really know what to expect. There was a whole bunch of new influences being introduced to me and a whole bunch of new people that I had never seen before. And so, and the first person I met, I decided that they were going to be my friend. As our friendship continued to grow throughout the year, I noticed that she began to cling towards things that were like the popular kids were doing or things that would make her feel like more cool about herself. and. Like she actually fit in, almost like the movies, like where you have to go to parties and you have to drink alcohol and do drugs to have a good time. And it was really hard having that like constant nagging, like, oh, why can't we just get drunk or why can't we just do this? So even though she, she was into all of those things and I really wasn't, um, I would still try to adapt to her and to, for, to make myself more appealing to her. I didn't dress as modestly or conservatively and I would cuss a lot and be more provocative with what I was saying and wearing. Um, I didn't hold myself to the same standards that I hold myself today. I was more likely to do those things with her than with other people. So halfway through sophomore year, she got this boyfriend and her boyfriend was really into drugs. He was a drug dealer and he was constantly getting into fights with his mom and getting kicked out of the house and being left on the streets, getting arrested by the police. He wasn't really nice to her either. He would say that she was ugly and he would be demeaning. And I could see like her self-esteem was taking a real blow. And I would tell her like, maybe it's time for you to break up with him or maybe it's time for you guys to take a break. Like you don't need him in your life. You could do so much better. And she wouldn't want to listen to me. And so finally, at the end of me constantly nagging her and telling her that she needed to break up with his boyfriend, she was done with me. And she told me that I didn't need to be involved in her life anymore if I wasn't going to be supportive. The other friends that I had met were a group of three little um, Christian girls and during lunch they would go to a Christian club meeting. And so I was like, okay, well, I want to sit with you guys during lunch, so I'll go and I'll sit in the club with you once a week. It's not that bad. Um, so for like the first two years of high school, freshman and sophomore year, um, I went to Christian club and it made me begin to think like what was going on in my life right now and how it related to God and how it all made sense. And so I went into um, my junior year with a whole new mindset. Looking back at it now, um, that experience just really taught me like the difference between right and wrong. Like I can see a huge change in myself. And I think God put that there just to show me like, yes, you can make a change. And yes, this is what I'm here for, for you to be new and for you to be renewed in me. Here's, here's how you impact the kingdom of God here at Hollywood Christian School, because we, we, if you're a citizen of his kingdom, because just like I told you before, there, there are some who get it and some who don't, even here at Hollywood Christian School. And I want to tell you something. I, I recognize those of you in this room that get it. I, I recognize those of you who, who, re, who realize that, you know what, I, I know that other people around me are getting caught up in drama. I know that other people around me are saying and doing things that 
they know are not fit for a student at this school. I, I know you hear students who, who use words and language that does not align with the word of God, but, but I see you, and I see you standing strong. I, I see you bringing your encouragement with you. I see you being a positive influence, even when others around you are being negative. I, I see you when, when you are working hard to make the grade. I see you when you are giving your, your full effort into doing your absolute best, regardless of what other people around you are doing. I see you, and I know who you are. Because I'm running this school, I may not get to come and sit down with you every single day. I may not get to talk to you all the time, but I pay attention, and I know who you are. This is how you impact Hollywood Christian School with the kingdom of God. Because our vision at Hollywood Christian School with a catalyst for world-class community center education, you all need to become a community in and of this community. And you all need to start encouraging each other. This, this is a Christian school. You recognize you have the freedom to start a student small group and say, let's get together two days out of the week and let's just deal with the stuff that we're going through. Let's take it to the word of God. Let's deal with it in prayer. Let's strengthen and encourage one another. You know you have the freedom to, to say, Let, let's get together. And e even, if, even if it ain't for a Bible study, just to encourage each other, you have the freedom to do that. And when you begin to build that community here and strengthen each other, you begin to generate this influence that I assure you will change the lives of those around you. A hardworking person will eventually become the boss of a lazy person any day of the week. I know who you are. Be who you are. The Bible says that it's no good to take a light and hide it under a bushel. Some of you in this room, you have it in you to positively impact this whole entire school. You have it in you to do it right now. And let me encourage you, stop hiding who you are. You are a powerful man of God. You are a powerful woman of God. Release your potential, fulfill God's will, complete his plan for your life. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We thank you so much that we have the privilege of doing your work and your will your way. Father, let your kingdom come at Hollywood Christian School. Let your will be done. I pray for the seed students that you put in this place, that you've granted purpose, that you've planted a plan, that you have prepared a path for them to be a mighty and a powerful influence in the lives of their peers and everyone they touch. Father, we call forth your word from the beginning of time that these young people would stand up and stand out, that they would accept the fact that they are from your country, that they are from your kingdom, and that they are willing to do your will at whatever the cost. I pray you give them encouragement. I pray you give them a vision, and I pray you give them dreams that won't let them sleep until it's fulfilled. Father, I pray that you will stir in their hearts the capacity to forgive, and to love, to be humble, yet to be bold. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will spring them up right here in this place. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all have a good day.